As a member of the organizing committee, I am very pleased to welcome you to the 2021 Jewish Book Festival. This is our festival's 23rd year. The members of our committee, our leader Kim Benaji, and our Jewish Federation are thrilled that we continue to bring quality programs like this to our community and to see so many of you taking part in the festival. Today's program would not be possible without the continued support of our Jewish Federation of the Greater San Gabriel and Pomona Valleys, the Jewish Book Council in New York, and the generosity of our literary circle. The University of Laverne's Kristallnacht Memorial Lecture is one of the highlights of our festival every year. Right now, I'd like to introduce the university's chaplain, Dr. Zandra Wagner, and its president, Dr. Devorah Lieberman, to share a few words with you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I want to add my welcome from the University of Laverne. This afternoon's, this afternoon's lecture acknowledges and honors the memory of Kristallnacht. Tuesday, November 9th marks the 83rd anniversary of this tragic event. Kristallnacht literally means night of crystal and is often referred to as the night of broken glass. The name refers to the violent wave of anti-Jewish pogroms which took place throughout Nazi Germany and Austria on November 9 and 10 in 1938. The violence resulted in the loss of Jewish lives and the destruction of Jewish property, littering the streets with shards of broken glass. Kristallnacht is often understood as the beginning of the Jewish Holocaust. I invite you to take a moment of silence in honor of Kristallnacht and the many lives lost. Thank you. This annual lecture series, uh, this partnership, gives our communities the opportunity to focus on Jewish history and experience, to make links between the past and our own challenges today, and to gather in a spirit of remembrance and reflection. At this time, I would like to introduce the president of the University of Laverne, Dr. Devorah Lieberman, who will share a few words of welcome. Dr. Lieberman is the 18th president of Laverne. Her accomplishments and her talents are many, but I would just like to say uh, just a couple words that are a little more personal. Dr. Lieberman's passion for higher education is grounded in her commitment to the ideals of human dignity and the infinite worth of each person. She has an optimistic spirit that sees potential in our students at the university, in our communities, and in the future we all share. Her positive approach is genuine and inspiring, and it's always a pleasure to work with Dr. Lieberman and to be part of her unfolding vision. Will you please join me in welcoming President Deborah Lieberman. Thank you very, very much, uh, Zandra. I just, I wanna make sure I'm following all, I've unmuted, I've got my camera on, I'm with everybody. We have this big audience. We're all together today for one reason, and that is to recognize Kristallnacht, to never forget, to always remember, and to come together as community so that we in our own ways can practice tikkun olam. For those of you who are not familiar with the University of Laverne, um, bear with me for a minute where I give you a little history and I think it will unfold for you how um, relevant it is to have Kristallnacht at, recognized at the University of Laverne and how deeply, profoundly honored we are to be part of this community and to be part of this uh, annual, um, the coming together through literature and that and much bigger coming together in ways in unison truly to practice what we all say as tikkun olam. So the University of Laverne, and many of you are from Southern California from all over the country. The University of Laverne is located 35 miles just southeast of Los Angeles. We are 130 years old, founded by the Church of the Brethren in 1891. And you may say, Church of the Brethren, how can someone named Lieberman be 
affiliated with the brethren. Well, even though we're no longer affiliated with the Church of the Brethren, we are deeply, deeply connected to the roots of the brethren, and even more importantly, the values and the philosophy of what started the Brethren Church and why the church started the University of Laverne. So 130 years ago, when we were founded uh, by the church, we were found, the church created this university and it was very clear and very explicit that this university would be grounded in four specific values and every student who graduates from the university would practice those values for the rest of their lives. And those four values that founded and grounded this university in 1891 are the same values that ground this university today. And those values are that every student, faculty, and staff member will be committed to civic and community engagement, will be committed to lifelong learning, will be committed to ethical decision-making, and finally, will be committed to diversity and inclusion. When I interviewed at the University of Laverne 11 years ago, I learned about those values, I met the students, the faculty, and the staff, and I said, if this university truly walks the talk, then I'm interested in coming to the University of Laverne with my family, my husband, etc." So I found that was actually, it wasn't just rhetoric, it was what, it's the water that the university swims in. So here we are today, uh, 2021, almost 2022, the same values, five colleges within this university, College of Education, College of Business, College of Law, College of Arts and Sciences, and College of um, Health and Community Wellbeing, doctoral programs, master's programs, undergraduate programs. What's so remarkable about the university, aside from all the programs, are of our 7,000 students, 70% of the students at the university are students of color. Most of the students are middle and lower income. Most of the students are first generation. Most of the students are Latinx or Hispanic. These are the students of the future, the citizens of the future, the leaders of the future, every single one of them will carry the values of the University of Laverne, and they're the same values that I grew up with in a Jewish family and within the Jewish tradition. So here we are today at Kristallnacht, practicing the values that I grew up with, practicing the values of the University of Laverne, and coming together as one community. I welcome you to the book festival today. I look forward to hearing from our author, I look forward to meeting every single one of you someday in the near or distant future. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Lieberman. It's an honor as well as a pleasure for our festival to be part of this commemoration. And I know our community appreciates what you do. Before I introduce you to today's author, please note that you will be able to ask questions after the presentation. To do so, just go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type them in. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leah Garrett. Leah Garrett is professor and director of Jewish studies at Hunter College in the City University of New York. She's published five books in Jewish studies. Her last book, Young Lions, How Jewish Writers Reinvented the American War Novel, won the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award and was shortlisted for the National Jewish Book Award. The book that she's going to be talking about today, X Troop, um, here, uh, has been featured on CNN, Time Magazine, The Guardian, among others. Won't you please join me in welcoming Leah Garrett. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. And I'll confess I didn't know much about um, universe, the University of Laverne, but when I was listening to it, it sounds exactly like the student body at Hunter College, uh, diverse first in college. So it's really exciting to be here. And I think a very similar kind of um, atmosphere as the one I work in. 
I think so. Well, let's get started. Um, I guess the first thing to ask is who and what was X Troop? So in 1942, when the war was going poorly against the British, um, Churchill and Lord Mountbatten decided they needed to do something pretty, pretty radical here. So they decided to create something called the Inter-Allied 10 Commando Unit. And it would be a commando unit made up of a like a Belgian troop and a French troop and different troops of people who really felt very strongly that they had to get back and fight and kill and capture and interrogate Nazis. But amongst this troop of all these different commando units, they also decided that they wanted to create a German speaking unit. And the idea with this German speaking unit would be that they would be a secret commander troop. Nobody would know about them. And not only would they be able to be trained as commanders to capture the enemy, but really crucially because of their German language, they would interrogate them in the battlefield on the spot and get this intelligence that would help them win the war. Now, something that they didn't discuss when just thinking about creating this new German speaking commando unit in 1942 was in the UK in 1942, 85% of the German speakers are Jews, they're Jewish refugees. So what ends up happening, I'm sure we'll go into detail for the whole sort of story of this, um, of the X troop, but what ends up happening is when they start looking for the people who will make up their commando unit, the people that they end up finding are 98% are Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria. So these were people who's, and when we're talking about Kristallnacht, Kristallnacht was absolutely basic to all of the commando stories because they're all Holocaust survivors, basically. They all have parents who after Kristallnacht have to make that impossible decision that they want to rescue their kids. And they know, as we all know about Jews during the Holocaust in Germany and Austria, no country is going to take them. So this idea people have, well, why didn't the Jews leave? Nobody would take them. But fortunately, the United Kingdom had set up a, a transit visa program for younger people, as well as a kinder transport program, a train program run through the Quakers to get them out. So most of the men who become the ex-troop leave their families while they're in their teens by themselves, get to the UK. And then when the war breaks up, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, um, the British decide that they're going to intern uh, Germans because they're worried about them. And I'm sure we'll go into details about this. But eventually these guys get interned and they're finally selected in 1942 for this very important top secret commando unit, which during the course of the war, as I know we'll discuss, ends up being absolutely crucial to the British success because they're the tip of the sword for the British when they do their battles in Normandy, when they do the Battle of the Bulge, all over the place. Um, these guys are at the forefront. And just two more quick points about them before we get into the details. Um, when I wrote this book, I I I couldn't believe no, I, I couldn't believe I discovered this this unknown, incredibly crucial story of Jews fighting back during World War II. But part of the reason the story, of many reasons it's so extraordinary, is that when they're chosen for the commando unit, and this is really essential to who the X troop were, in the Inter-Allied 10 commando unit, this isn't going to be called the German unit. They decide they're going to call it the British unit. And what that means is that when all the men are selected, they're given a, and these are all Jewish guys from Germany and Austria, they're given about 10 minutes to come up with fake British names, fake British backstories that explain why they have these German accents. And they're all given a Church of England uh, dog tag. So if they're killed in battle, they're going to be buried as Christians. And they're all going to have to pretend through the entire war that they're these British guys. So they all have fake names. Um, and that's really crucial to the story of the X Troop too, which is that they all have to sort of sublimate their true story and their Jewishness in order to become commandos. And to a man, they, they, they were excited to get to do this because for all of the men in the X troop, the war was personal. They had family members who they knew were hiding. And the minute they could get the war over with, the minute they could rescue their families. So just one last point, and then I'll be quiet because I, I love talking about X Troop. And, uh, Don't be quiet. <laughs> get me going. I mean, it's been the most 
extraordinary passion project in my life getting to write this book. But I just want to share something that happened um, a week ago today. I um, So when the book was published, I got an email from somebody in California who read the book. And she said, you know, my great uncle was an ex-trooper and he was one of the men who was buried under a cross. And she said, I don't know what to do about it. We want him to be buried under Star of David. We don't have the money to move him. On, like we, and how do we do the paperwork and all this stuff? So I put her in touch with this incredible Jewish veteran in the UK who's devoted his whole entire life to getting the story of Jew- Jewish servicemen out to the public. And they got in touch with each other. And I didn't. He- I sort of didn't hear anything, but I knew something was going on. And then a week ago, um, I get an invitation for a week ago last Sunday to attend a Zoom ceremony. And I cried through the entire ceremony because what they, I'm actually going to get emotional now too. What they ended up doing was they got a full uh, military representation of Jewish veterans. They had a bugle bugler there and they reinterred this ex trooper from a star of David. I mean, from a cross under a star of David last, last Sunday. So the story of the ex troop goes long and, you know, many decades later, we still have this, beautiful moment last Sunday when one of them was actually put under Star of David. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. How did you first uh, discover the story and why didn't we hear about it until now? So my last book, which you mentioned, was also about World War II and Jewish servicemen. And the reason I was always interested in Jewish servicemen was because my grandfather, Abraham Klein, he served in World War II. All my great uncles served. And also, I always found it really interesting that I came from this very sort of left-wing Jewish, socialist, Yiddish family. They lived in a Yiddish community. But my grandmother and my grandfather were so profoundly patriotic. And I I always wanted to know, like, what what was that about? And for them, it had everything to do with World War II and the fact that American Jews got to go back to Europe and fight Nazis. And my grandfather was from Hungary, so it was very personal, this whole thing for him. So when I wrote my last book, I remained completely obsessed with World War II. Um, But I I sort of thought, well, all the stories have been told. And and I also felt a few things. I felt like so much of our stories about World War II, the way we talk about Jews is entirely as victims. And there's not enough stories that tell about those myriad moments when Jews fought back. So I was still really interested in Jewish soldiers and Jewish warriors who fought Nazis. So that was really important to me. I felt the time was right now with all the stuff Uh, anti-Semitism, all the stuff we've been dealing with. We need to talk about this stuff more about these Jews who got agency and fought back. So I was really interested in it. And then when I started to hear about this commando unit, I realized to my shock that there was a huge amount of material on it, but nobody had written a book about it. So when I made the decision I wanted to write this book, I started to get in touch with commando families. And it was like, just there was so much material that families had kept from the war. And then I also discovered the Holocaust Museum had some archives, the Imperial War Museum had archives. So there was archives all over the place. It just needed someone to write the book. But but the reason the story hadn't been told before, I think is for a couple of reasons. One is because it was totally top secret. Like nobody knew that about the, no, they were called the British troop during the war. Only one secretary at MI5 had the list of their real names, which I got to saw, see when I was writing the book. Nobody knew they existed. And after the war, most of the men kept their nom de gores. So they kept their fake British names. Those who remained in the UK mostly did not raise their kids as Jewish which is a whole nother story we'll probably get into. But so there was a huge cloak of secrecy around it. The other reason that the story hadn't been written, I think, was when the British made the decision that they would create this commando unit. And I'm sure we'll talk about the training and all the stuff that they went through. But it quickly became clear to the British high command and the military that these guys were extraordinary. They were really smart. They were physically adept. And the most important thing was because the war was personal for them, they would do anything it took to beat the Nazis, anything it took. They would put their hand up for the most dangerous missions. So when the war starts and when when, we're ha- when we have D-Day, con- sorry, when it's 1942, and then finally we're getting towards D-Day when most of these men are going to finally hit the beaches, 
the British decide that the X troop is actually too valuable to let them fight as their own unit because what if a shell explodes and they're they're lost? And they and it's also realized they're so good and they're so insanely prepared and ready to do battle and they have this German stuff so they can interrogate people in the battlefield that they're way too valuable to to put them on their own and instead what they're going to do is put them in twos and threes and fours with existing commando units so what it means when I had to write the book was normally when you write a military history which I this is a military history but it's also a history of all of these different men's men and their stories and I try and tell their whole life stories as well but it meant that to get all the archival material I had to if if four of them are serving with 41 commando then I have to go to get the war diaries of 41 commando to make sure all of the post war interviews the guys did are factual, like if they remember killing Nazis on this hill, does the war diary say that they were actually there because we know how memory works? In almost every case, they completely remembered it correctly. But it meant to write their story wasn't just writing about sort of one group, X troop, who they did, because all these different groups have their war diaries. The British kept this thing called war diaries, but it it was a huge archival endeavor because I had to go into all the different locations where the ex-troopers were. Does that make sense? So if like I was writing a book about panzer divisions, I could just folk, but these guys were everywhere on every front. So I think that's the other reason the story hadn't been told before. So that's interesting because they were specialists. So, um, Tell us a little bit about the members whose lives you follow in the book and how they ended up in the UK uh, to start with. Okay, so uh, I'll mention a couple. I I, I, fo- I tell you the whole story of the troop, which is 87 men, but I focus in more detail like on three to 10 of them. But I'll tell you just very quickly about the three I really focus in on. Um, one of the men I write a, a lot about was this incredible ga- man called Monfred Gons. In the war, he becomes Fred Gray. And he was an Orthodox Jewish guy from Bork in Germany. And he had a really happy childhood until the rise of Nazism. Um, he came from the, like a staunch Zionist and religious family. So, you know, he always fought back with the rise of Nazism, but it was dangerous times. I mean, he, he wrote and spoke about, you know, when the Jews weren't allowed to go to the movie houses, when the Jews weren't allowed to play soccer, like everything he loved as a kid st- started to disappear for him. And Borkin was a really Nazi heavy place. So his family sees the writing on the wall and they put him on a train by himself when I think he's like 16 and he gets to the UK. And um, and his story is really incredible because a lot of his story talks about sort of trying to figure out where his parents were during the war. So he and also for him, um, it was it was it was different than the others because he was Orthodox. Most of the Jews who come from Austria and Germany at this time, as we all know, were middle class, right? And they're quite fairly secular. So the other two I I write in detail about are, are more typical. Um, one is a guy, a guy called Colin Anson, who um, has a dad he loves. He's growing up in Germany. He doesn't know he's Jewish because typically many German Jewish families start hiding this information from their kids with the rise of Nazism till his dad sits him down one day when he's like 13 and says, son, I need to tell you something. And he's completely shocked. He, as he said in one of his interviews, like I could not believe when the Nazis were talking about the enemy, they were talking about me. He had no, he had no idea. So um, the way he ends up going to the UK is He's having, he's at a beer hall with his dad when he's like 15 and his dad is Jewish and he's political and he starts speaking out loud against the Nazis and some German Americans who were often the worst are tourists there. They hear him saying stuff about the Nazis and the police are called. His dad's taken away. He's sent to Dachau concentration camp and two weeks later he's dead. And his mom says, I have to get my son out of here. And she very luckily gets him on a kinder transport, even though he's a bit older. He's, I think he's about 16 at this time. It was a little bit older. So he gets out that way. And the third person I write about in more detail, and the book, by the way, um, if you get the book, I have photos of all of these guys, incredible photos of these guys as kids and just illuminates so much when you see see, see their faces, I think. But the third one I, I write in more detail about is Peter Masters, 
who grew up in a very cultured family in Vienna, lovely young man, wanted to be an artist, was, was focused on arts and music and culture, rise of Nazism. And, and in Austria, what we know about that was it was just so rapid how quickly it got terrible and there was no means of escape. Luckily, his mother found again a train ticket for him and he escapes with his mother and his sister, which is unusual, and then he gets to the UK. And then all of them, just one other point is when the war breaks out, Churchill infamously said, color the lot of them. And what that meant was that there was a worry that there was a fifth column, which meant enemy agitators amongst us. Basically the same idea here is the Japanese Americans. And they decide that they're going to interview all the Germans. And then they make a decision that the most dangerous Germans are single men. And all of the guys who are going to be ex-troopers are single men. And they all come on kinder transport. So before they're all chosen for to be commandos, they're locked up and interred behind barbed wire. And some, if you're interred in the UK, it's pretty bad. You go to the Isle of Man. There is literally barbed wire. You can't leave. You don't have news from home, which was the hardest thing for them. But at least those who were in the UK, they like they could create, you know, classes and cabarets and they did art and performance, like all this great cultural stuff. But unfortunately, the British also decided that they would inter a bunch of them by shipping them to Canada and to Australia. And the Australian ones are called the Denera Boys. And they were sent on horrific ships to terrible internment camps. The guys who were sent to Australia spent a year in the outback of Australia behind barbed wire. And I was fortunate enough when I wrote the book that I could interview two living commandos when I was writing the book. And one of them had been on the ship to Denera. And when I interviewed him, he literally, he was in his late nineties and he, he, and this is important because of what we're commemorating today that I'm going to mention this. Um, And he shook with rage as he told me that the guys who were sent on the trip to Australia on the Denera ship, the crew was a bunch of anti-Semite Brits who ended up all being court-martialed because of how terrible they were. But for fun, they would smash glass on the deck and make all these Jewish refugees run barefoot across it. And these guys are already completely traumatized because, you know, they've, they've lost everything. And when they're put on the ship, this lovely crew decide to take everything they have and throw it overboard. And I, I tell the story in my book. I mean, not only are they losing like, you know, wedding rings and photos and Taliesin to fill in all this important Jew- stuff, personal and Jewish stuff. But there's one story of a guy who gets out with his son and he goes to the Denaro ship and all he has left is this violin that he wants his son to be able to play that's all that's all he cares about is this violin and he's there with his son and they throw that overboard and he fights them and and it's just so many stories like that um so that's where they're coming from unbelievably before one of the guys who was interviewed said um it was the inter because they were interviewed by mi5 and he said it was so shocking that i went into the interview not being trusted to have anything more serious than like a shovel. And I come out of it being told, look, you get to be a commando with these guns. I mean, it was head spinningly bizarre, the whole trajectory, but that's where they come from. It's it's fascinating and horrible at, at the same time. And in your book, it's really vivid and very personal. I, I mean, it, um, I wanted to ask uh, who recruited them for the commandos and what was the training like and were they treated differently from the other commando units? Great question. So, um, so they were recruit. They, bef- after they're let out of internment, these guys all want to join the military and they all want to fight the Nazis. Cause I said like, it's personal, but these are also like these really strong warrior types, a bunch of them as well. They want to, they want to take the fight to the Nazis. British military will only first let them into something called the pioneer Corps, which is a non-combat unit, which was, so frustrating for them. So they were building bridges knowing that they should go fight. And the Pioneer Corps, they were put in something called for A for Alien Corps. So they they were all amongst each with each other, right? They had this nice community, but they weren't allowed to do any real fighting. 
So when they decide to create this, 19, this commando unit in 1942, they start to look in the Pioneer Corps because that's where all the guys are. And immediately commanding officers like know who to, who, who, to, who are the guys who are escaping, like sneaking off the base to try and take the RAF pilots training. That guy who's writing letters saying, I want to fight in the army, that guy. Who's winning all the cross country races, that guy. So they quickly, and who's volunteering for all the most dangerous duty because they put signs up you know, this, these 30 guys. So they pick a, a couple hundred of them to interview with MI5 in London. And amongst that, they choose the group who's going to be the X troop. Then they all have to go through the name change. Um, and they, many of them said like, to suddenly have a new name when you're like 18 or 19, and also to have to remember everyone else's new name, because they all sort of knew each other from the Pioneer Corps. And then they're all given fake badges that they have to wear to pretend they're with existing units. And they're, they're wearing their, their dog, ta- you know, Church of England. It's really mind blowing. And then on top of it all, the guy who is their commanding officer is this huge hero of my book, um, Brian Hilton Jones. He's not Jewish, he's Welsh. He had a degree in languages from Cambridge, I think really smart guy. He knew German fluently. He's a mountaineer. And because he's Welsh, though, um, they decide that he, he decides with the Brits, they're going to do all their, their training in this tiny little seaside town in Wales, which could not have been a more serious type of complete culture shock from these cultured, you know, these kids from Vienna who like have been going to these art museums and, and suddenly they're thrown into this Welsh village. They all have fake names, fake backstories. They can't talk amongst each other about their backgrounds because they know this is too dangerous because if any of them are captured, they don't they don't want to know anything about who each other are because that would be too dangerous. They have to be, pretend to be British. They're eating Welsh food. They're living with Welsh locals because they were all put with different Welsh locals. They're not talking about their Jewishness. Um, it's interesting when I, I wrote the, the, the book, I, I the the. I wrote a lot about that guy, Manfred Gans, the Orthodox Jewish guy. And I became friends with his kids when I was writing the book. They were very generous. And before I went to publication, I just, because he's such a big person in my story, I wanted his kids to read the book because I wanted to make sure I got him right. And when I talked about him going to Wales and him having to pack up his talus and to fill in, and they all had secret addresses where they could send stuff to I made I, the, the first draft of the book, I made it this really agonizing thing that he went through, which is how I imagined it would be. You know, he can't do Shabbat anymore. He can't keep kosher, has to pretend his name is Fred Gray. And his, <laughs> when his son read it, he said, it wasn't like that. Monfred would do anything it took to capture and kill Nazis. And if this is what it took, so be it. And I think that's actually more what it was like for them. I think that was more the experience of it was it was very hard to take on these new names, very hard to take on these fake personas. But these were such focused guys that they had their eyes on the prize and they knew the prize was to be the Nazis and whatever, literally whatever it took would be worth it. So when they go to Wales, they spend about a year doing training and the training, as Brian Hilton Jones said, is gonna be the most intense and thorough of any command in the British army because these guys are going to be trained as commandos and in counterintelligence. So they're going to be trained to kill and capture Nazis, which means weapons training, climbing mountains, jumping out of planes, everything you can imagine, going for days in the dark. I mean, just everything. And they're also going to learn all the counterintelligence, how to do interrogations, how to get information from the enemy. So after a year, and this is what the British recognized after that year, God, these guys are it's nuts how incredible they are. Um, that's why they make the decision after the year that they're too valuable as well, not only because of their focus, but because their training is so thorough as well. Fascinating. Um, so where were they sent first? And what was the main uh, thrust of their campaign? Yeah, so th- the very first place that they were sent was actually on parachutes to go behind enemy lines. That's the stuff I have the least information on my book because that's still classified. I had to declassify a lot of stuff, but that stuff is still pretty much classified. So some of them, one of them, and I talk about like in the days before the Normandy landings, this guy called George Lane is sent on a little 
dinghy to land on the Normandy coast because there's been a rumor that the Germans have a new type of mine. And if there's a new type of mine, they can't do the D-Day landings as planned. So his job literally is to take a little boat to the Normandy coast and bring back a mine. Fortunately, he's a bit of a superman and he was in the um, Hungarian Olympic polo water team. So he's like very capable. <laughs> And he, he goes three times and he's, he's eventually captured on the third attempt. But um, in his military medal after the war, it said, but for what George Lane de- did, we wouldn't have been able to do D-Day as planned. It was so crucial, the intelligence he got about the type of mines, which he brought back to base. So they're doing, they're doing intelligence before the landings. A bunch of them are chosen, I think four of them are chosen for the Sicily campaign, sort of the first campaign. Um, And I think that was just pretty much to test the waters and immediately they take leadership roles and they're incredible. But the great majority of them are sent to land at D-Day with a range of commando units at Sword Beach. So that's that's really where they hit the ground um, at that moment at Sword Beach. And I can tell you more details about that if you want to. Yeah, that that's pretty amazing. Um, now, um, how did they deal with their family who had been taken by the Nazis? I know that that figures into one of their stories. Yeah, Can it's actually yeah, it's a it 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 shows up a lot with them because, like I said, they're all under fake British names, right? Fake backstories, but the British army army knows that these guys all have people who they're worried about. Mm. So they're all given permission to create fake addresses where a male will go to just one person they trust that can eventually maybe get it to them. And so some of them are actually able to keep track of family members during the war. Um, I write about two men who this happens to. One man I write about is this guy named Ron Gilbert, who was on the Daenerys ship. And um, he ends up being like such a warrior during the war. But for him, the clock's ticking because... His parents were taken away, but his sister's in hiding in France. So the minute France is liberated, he gets permission to go in a Jeep to find his sister. And I have the most beautiful photo in my book when he finds his sister in Paris. So he's actually able to track down his sister and find her. The other one I talk extensively about the book and is the main, this is the main reason I hope people read get by the book and read this part of the book. Um, Cause I, I was talking to his daughter about this yesterday and I'll talk a bit more about this was Monfred Gans. He was the one from the Orthodox Jewish family in Borken who ends up going to Sword Beach. He's incredible. Like when he lands at Sword Beach, he immediately captures 25 Germans, interrogates them and finds out where the mines are laid so that they can get off the beach. Like every every step of the war, he, his hand is up, but he's such a great warrior. And he's killing and capturing, interrogating the enemy like no one else. He's constantly offered um, commissions to go to officer training school. He, like the other ex-trooper, says no. Every time they don't want to leave battle, he wants to be on the battlefield. He does not want to be an officer going somewhere else to get trained. Um, eventually he accepts, which this is just all so unusual, but it's because they were so focused. He, effect, he eventually accepts a battlefield commission, which is very rare during World War II with the British. They did not do these because they knew they had to make him into an officer and he wasn't going to leave the battlefield. So he's 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 like a complete standout. And I can tell you more stories about him or you can read about in the book during the war. But the whole time the war is going on, He's, he's trying to keep tr- track of his parents who at the start of the war have gone into hiding in, in um, on this little sort of Jewish free area. So it's an area that's not supposed to have Jews. They're hiding there. During the war through his secret mailbox, he gets the first notice, which was horrific for him that they've been taken to Bergen-Belsen, both of his parents. And I have in the book um, a letter he writes where he says, now it's completely personal. I have to beat the Nazis to get my parents. That's all that matters. Whatever it takes, I have to get my parents. Then he sort of hears through the Red Cross that they're in Bergen-Belsen. But in the final months of the war, a telegram gets through, through all this, these, these long networks that get through, um, gets to him. 
that his parents had been moved from Bergen Belzen to Terrorzenstadt concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. And he goes to his commanding officer, the war has not ended yet. And he says, I have to get my parents out. And by this point, he's had a battlefield commission, very rare. He is a complete superstar who's been the reason that they won so many crucial battles. And um, he goes to his commanding officer and he says to him, you have to give me a Jeep and you have to give me a driver because I have to drive across war-torn Germany, which is totally apocalyptic, to Czechoslovakia because I have to find my parents at Terrace and Stock concentration camp. And um, my book is very optimistic. So he does this thing that is sort of, to me, one of the most extraordinary stories of the entire war, which is he does this. And he wrote a diary of it that they keep at the Holocaust Museum. And so I have a chapter in the book, which is pretty much in his own words, um, with him driving to to the, re- the concentration camp to find his parents. That's amazing. That is really mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to uh, start taking questions pretty soon, but I did want to ask you um, what role they had after the war and whether they came back to the UK and what happened to them after, just generally. Okay. All right. So um, so when VE Day, happen- VE Day happens in 1945, for British and American soldiers, the war is over. For these guys, the war is actually only just starting because now they have to figure out if anyone's still alive and what's happened to the family members. But it's even more complicated for the ex troop because the British, though they end up naturalizing like the Polish troop and the French troop, they don't. They decide not to naturalize the ex troopers. So suddenly, when VE Day happens, all of these guys are still stateless. They're still enemy aliens. And the military, though, still realizes how much worth they have. So they decide that they're going to use these guys, which they actually wanted to do these guys, to be the the guys who would do the denazification campaigns. So from basically 1945 to 1947, these guys are all sent back to Germany and Austria to root out and find Nazis, to gather information for the Nuremberg trials. Like Ron Gilbert, the one who found his, his sister, he, he's given a gun and told to go find people who were Nazis. And he literally finds scores of hidden Nazis. Manfred Gans, it's incredible. And this is just one of many incredible parts of the book. He sent back to his town of Bork in Germany where he was raised to be in charge of denazification. And because he was raised there, he knows who the bad guys are. He knows who the teacher was, who was terrible to the Jewish kids. And he knows who the good guys are. So as the denazification officer for those years, he can he 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 knows exactly who's who, who were Nazis. And he's so good at it that he's also given the job to interrogate high-ranking Nazi officials. So they're incredibly crucial in those years after the war. And all of while this is happening, and, and, and they're all dedicated to writing the world and making it better after what the Nazis have done. Brian Hilton Jones, their commanding officer, is fighting with parliament to get them naturalized. Finally, they're naturalized in 1947, which is great. Wow. So they finally, I mean, majority of them stay in the UK. And I tell, I, 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 wrote, I, I knew when I was writing this book, I was unusual as a woman writing a military history. And I have to say very unusual as a Jew and as an American to write like a military history as well about World War II. And I I felt it was really important that this book would be as much about the Holocaust as it was about the war, that they shouldn't be these separate things. So I made sure to tell the sort of their whole stories. I I give you an epilogue where I tell you what happens to all these guys, because I really wanted to talk about them as fathers and grandfathers too, as a mother, like this stuff's important to me. Um, So I give you that at the end. But so they all, after the war, Majority of them want just pretty much peaceful lives after all that they've been through. They've incredibly successful lives. And just one final point I'll say about them, um, which has to do with that reinternment that I talked about under a star of David. In 1990, a a bunch of uh, a small little group of them in the UK decide that they're going to create a memorial to the troop in the Welsh town where they did their training. Um, But because it's it's still such a 
difficult thing. I, I, for a number of reasons I talk about in the book, they decide not to word, put the word Jewish on the memorial. So the memorial exists in, in the small town in Wales, does not mention they're Jewish. The plaque about them doesn't mention it. The tourist brochure the town gives does not talk about them being Jewish. The same guy who worked to get the cross to a star of David has been fighting that town council for 20 years and they say they're not budging. So what we say to people is if you ever go to the memorial, bring a star of David and put it there because this was the Jewish troop. They fought as Jews and it's a Jewish story of heroism and fighting back and taking agency back and making the world better. It's pretty amazing. I do have a couple of questions. Um, out of the 87 men who were trained, how many survived? So uh, they had a question. Because be, Peter Masters, the, the guy I talked about from the bicycle, from Vienna, he was in the bicycle troop, but that's a whole other story in the book. But yeah. he said the thing that was most unique about the X troop was that when other commanders and soldiers drew straws to see who got to stay behind, they drew straws to see who got to do the most dangerous missions, which meant that unfortunately they had a pretty high mortality and um, casualty rate and more than half of them uh, were lost in war. So about 42 of them survived the war. Uh, and that's a very high casualty rate, but it, it's yeah. not because they were effective. They were incredibly effective during the war and I believe made it to the British one, um, but they were always at the front of every most dangerous battle. That's it's pretty pretty serious um now you you say some of them most of them kept their uh british identities after the war um and another thing that you said i think maybe even in the introduction is that that many of the children uh of these men were not raised jewish um but one of them did go back to his regular identity um uh, can you talk about that and yeah, about his so family yeah, so that was really hard for, it was actually really interesting because I interviewed as many of the commando kids as I could find. And most of them talked about like becoming teenagers and starting to get an idea that they might be Jewish and then figuring it out because they had relatives or something didn't seem quite right or they wanted more information. Most of those who remained in the UK though, like I said, they did not raise their kids as Jewish. For those who emigrated to the United States though, most of those guys did raised their kids Jewish. Monford Gans, the Orthodox mm -hmm. Jewish one who rescued his parents. Mm -hmm. When he rescued his parents and he kept the diary, he said, I'm like the first thing I'm doing back after this is switching back to my birth name. And I was speaking at his daughter's synagogue the other day and I asked her about that. And she said, for him, the birth name was his Jewish name. Like it was a reclaiming of that identity, mm -hmm. but it was really complicated for the men. When I wrote the book, there were two commandos still alive. One of the commandos who um, who really didn't want to talk about it, but eventually he agreed to let me interview him and I interviewed him for the book. But he made me promise when I wrote the book that I wouldn't say who it, either his real birth name or his the name he used in war, because besides his wife, nobody knew that he was a Holocaust survivor. Nobody knew his parents had been killed in the Holocaust. He. Mm -hmm. He had taken on that British persona and he, it was a place he did not want to go at all. So when I interviewed him, it was incredible. Like he showed me the letter from Brian Hilton Jones and he, like he talked about the dinero, the ship and the, the glass and all that stuff. But he, he sort of, it was, his story was, was fairly typical in terms of this sort of sense of, I think, deep trauma and not wanting to go to that place again. Pretty extraordinary. Was there anybody you could not reach uh, who or who refused to talk? Uh, um, he to... was the one who refused to talk, but man, I, I was so insistent. Like I tried every, for I tried phone calls, I tried emails, I tried like, I tried asking other commandos. And eventually I decided to write him a really formal, formal letter on my university stationery. And I sent it in the mail by post, believe it or not. And, and I left my phone number and that's, that's what kind of worked with him. And I think he just saw, and I think he was hearing from other commando kids that this woman could be trusted, that I really cared so much about this story. And I felt historically, I just felt the British needed to know this story. And, you know, when the book came out, it was incredible in the UK because like it was serialized in the Daily Mail, which is like, 
great. I mean, it was all over the place. And I, and I, and I, the most satisfying aspect of all of this, not only that I get emails every day from veterans, which is the coolest thing in the universe, but the fact that I'm hoping that what this has sort of forced British military folks to do is reevaluate the war and consider the importance of a Jewish commando unit as part of it. There were the Jewish partisans um, who who were different, but this was a, a commando unit who were incredibly affected and made a difference in the war. So he was the only one I couldn't reach, but eventually I broke him down and I interviewed him and he was wonderful and his wife was great. So that's, that's about as good as you could possibly get. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. Okay, well, I think uh, we have time for one or two more. Um, let's see. Uh, despite the commando's enormous commitment, do you think the British were exploiting these men? That's a great question, actually. Um, were the British exploiting the men? So one of the people who was, in, who was billeted with the men in Wales was the guy who ends up capturing that mine and um, was married to Miriam Rothschild, who was actually a Rothschild, and she was a really important scientist in her own right after the war. And she's an incredible woman who should have a whole book about her. And she said of the men that these guys were really unique because, you know, they would be talking about Schopenhauer together. So they were totally different from the average soldier. I don't think that they were, I don't think that they were recognized as people that could be exploited. I think that they were recognized as an incredibly effective weapon. But, and I also think the fact that the British went to such such depths to keep them protected during the war, to perhaps testifies to the fact that they knew that they could be expendable, but also testifies to the fact that they knew how um, how important these men were. So I, I, I think that they exploited them the way that they exploited whatever soldiers they had, but it was very, very terrible after the war when they did not naturalize them. That was terrible. Those two years were terrible. However, when most of the ex-troopers were interviewed, they were interviewed by different people after the war, like Stephen Ambrose um, for the World War II Museum, like in different places they were interviewed. And it's really interesting. They rarely talked, though, about either the being interned or not being naturalized. What they talked about effusively was how grateful they were that they were given a gun and told to fight the Nazis. Like what they felt... They felt some burn, but they also felt profound gratitude that they were given this opportunity, as they said, to try and right the, the wrong that the world had done to them, to the Jews. That is absolutely incredible. And I think, let's see, I think we've gone through most of the questions. Um, there's one last one. Um, let's see. Uh, Clara Gorfinkel asks, Dr. Garrett, are you familiar with the story of the Rosenstrasse where uh, women nonviolently challenged the Nazis to get their Jewish husbands released from prison in Berlin? No, I'm not, I, I'm not familiar with that. Place, I, I tend to focus on um, World War II, but, but you know, I, I do feel that really strongly right now, particularly, and I've been feeling this particularly strongly over the last six months where, you know, um, I don't really want to go into it, but at CUNY, there's been some sort of some BDS kind of stuff, and there's been anti-Semitism stuff. Though my university president is the best in the world, um, but I've been feeling really strongly that narratives of Jews resisting and fighting back in whatever form are really, really crucial right now. And I actually feel that they tend to be quite underrepresented because it kind of goes against sort of the Hollywood idea of like the kindly Gentile saving the Jews, which is great. And we should be very grateful for that. But there's also a lot of stories of Jews saving Jews and Jews rescuing Jews. So um, whenever I hear about these other things, I think right on, like that's, you know, that's why I wrote the extra trip. That's why I want you to get everyone's kids and grandkids to read this story, because I think we need to, we need to, add these Jewish voices to our narratives about World War II and the Holocaust. Does that make sense? Yes, and what a fabulous ending. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, let's see, I've got a bunch of housekeeping things, but uh, but basically um, I wanna tell everybody first that X Troop is available for purchase at our local partner and uh, bookstore, Roman's Bookstore, which is over 100 years old. It's in Pasadena. And Leah, um, I think you've signed some book plates 
for anybody who requests them. So if you order through Romans, and I think there'll be a link, uh, or it'll be sent to you if you're a participant. Um, so wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you, festival attendees, for all your support. We are here because of you. I'd like to thank our hardworking committee members, the Jewish Federation staff, our team of advanced volunteer readers, our literary circle, of course, the Jewish Book Council, and our community partners throughout the region. We'd also like to thank our behind the scenes webinar wizard, Jake Tavel, who makes it all look easy. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Shalom. Shalom.